I bet it's possible that you can resonate with some of the emotions that were just shared, some of the thoughts, some of the struggles. And we want to work through some of those realities in our lives this weekend at Grace as we continue in the series that we're going through this summer, where we're spending time in the book of Psalms. And the book of Psalms is this 150 uh, recorded selection of songs and poems and prayers that the people of God sang and read and connected to and recited. And, and as they sung those, as they were singing those and as they were praying those and as they were connecting with those, uh, connecting to God through those, they were bearing their hearts and their soul and what was going on inside of them. And we get a real clear picture of the, the heart, the soul, the mind, the attitude, the, the desperation, the good times, the bad times that are going on with the people of God. And as we're working through these, we're, we're having a chance to, to really put the mirror up to our own lives and consider how our lives are doing. And amidst the Psalms is this word, this word Selah, a word that, that we said, let's not just understand it when it shows up in the Psalms as we read, but let's make sure we, we really apply it as a principle to this summer. And we talked about Selah as this idea of pausing and pondering, and then ultimately that it would lead you to praising God. And so what we've been trying to do in this series is we've been trying to apply Selah through the book of Psalms to have something happen. And this is what it is. We said we wanted to spend this summer practicing Selah to produce life in our life. That as we work through this book that's right in the middle of our Bible, that's put together on purpose for a purpose, that it would help us fix our eyes on our inner selves. That if we're honest, our lives often lack life. And if we really want to address that, we need not look at the outside of us, but let's look at the inside of us. Let's look at how we really process the ups and downs, the, the discouraging moments and the encouraging moments. Let's really work through the highs and the lows. And let's understand this as we pause and ponder and consider and reflect on our lives so that we could give our actual lives real life. And we said all of this, helps us have a life that we all really want, which is a happy life or a blessed life, an abundant life, a rich life, a fulfilled life. And the Psalms just over and over are gonna point us back to the path of that being the inspired word, the truth of God's word and the incarnate King, God himself and the person of Jesus. And over and over, we're just gonna see those themes pop up. And so we said there's these different types of Psalms. We were gonna work through uh, eight different ones. So far, we've worked through two of them. We've talked about praise Psalms and we worked through a praise Psalm. And we said at the core of that is how we should interact with God, which is we would say praise the Lord. And then last weekend, we dealt with a wisdom psalm, and we talked about this idea of how if we're going to really be wise and we're really going to make the most of our lives, we've got to fear the Lord. And if you've missed any of this, we want to encourage you, go to the app or the website, and you can catch up. I am very confident that this weekend is something that we're all going to be able to relate to. And depending on where you're at in life, you're going to probably feel this weekend in a really unique way. And I'm trusting and praying that God would move significantly in the life of our church through this conversation and the psalm that we're going to work through this weekend. If you have ever played athletics, you know that coaches tell you to play every play like every play is equally important. They tell you to play every play as though every play really, really matters. And, and I know why they're doing that. I know why they're doing that. They want the athlete to really take every play seriously, to give 100%, to be fully committed to whatever is going on. But in an average NFL football game, there are 153 plays. Are they all really equal? In an average NBA basketball game, there's roughly 99 possessions per team or roughly 200 possessions. Are they all really equal? In a tennis match, there's a minimum of, depending on men's and women's in the tournament, three to five sets that have to be won with a minimum of six games per set and points that have to be won in each game. Are they all really equally important? In soccer, you play a minimum of 90 minutes plus stoppage time, sometimes over an hour. Is every minute of that game really equal? And again, I know why they tell us that. Because we don't know the significant plays often until they happen and they don't want us to have a significant play that we give up because we didn't work hard. But if we're real... If we're real and we really go back and we evaluate a game, second and seven in the first quarter is not as important as fourth and two with 50 seconds left. In fact, when you boil down most games, there are some key plays that actually decide who won and who lost. And again, there's a lot of it that really does matter in every single play. But at the end of the day, there's a, a critical turnover. Somebody fell down, a critical decision, a bad call, something that transpired. 
I've played in enough important to me basketball games to know that two free throws right before halftime have much less pressure than two free throws at the end of the game with no time left and you're down one. And I think what that illustrates is not just in sports, but something in life. And it's something that we all get and we all sense and we all kind of know this. And, and it's this, it's that not all moments are created equal. Not all moments are created equal. They might all be created equal in terms of time and, and again, the effort that we should give, but, but we know this. I mean, I, I made a lot of decisions on April 21st, 2001. I made a decision of what socks I was going to put on. I made a decision of what I was going to eat for breakfast. I, I made a decision on what conversations to have. But, but on that day, on April 21st, 2001, I made a decision when they asked me, do I want to make this woman my bride for life? I had to say yes or no. And frankly, that decision was way more important than what I ate for breakfast that day because not all the moments of that day were created equal. If you've ever run a business, you know that there are moments where you know that this is the moment, this hire is going to make all the difference. It is really critical that we get this right. It's really critical that we know what to do cash with the cash flow in this moment. You know that sometimes a conversation with your kids on an average Tuesday night is important, but it's not all that. But then they do something really dumb and they get in a lot of trouble and you're going to have to go talk to them. And you know, in that moment, it is really critical what you say. Your parents or at the end of their life. And you know they don't have long. And you fly somewhere or drive somewhere to talk to them. And you know that might be the last conversation you have. And you know that in that moment, it is not created equal to the moments that were before. Because you know that not all moments are created equal. Which means there are certain moments in life we have to win. We have to get right. We have to, we have to know, we have to have a plan. We have to understand that we need to seize these. And what's interesting this weekend is we're gonna, we're gonna talk about some moments that we have to win, but, but to be honest, not only do we not feel like winning them, we don't even feel like living through them. We don't even feel like wanting to address them. And we're like, I don't even know that I wanna get out of bed, let alone go after it. We're going to talk about some moments in our life when things are very, very difficult and challenging. In fact, we're going to talk about a lament psalm. And lament psalms show up in our life when the words that would be used to describe your life are words like despair, discouragement, disappointment, defeat, desperation. And I bet it grace... There are some people that that's what you feel right now is something in your life. You feel discouragement, you feel despair, you feel desperate. In fact, when we look at the Psalms over and over, when we get to the Lament Psalms, they, they give us language of what we feel in our soul. And as I bet, as I just kind of move through a few of these, I bet you have felt or are feeling or will feel this way at some point. This is what it says in various lament psalms. I'm just gonna go through a few. This is in Psalm 6.3. My soul is in deep anguish. How long, Lord, how long? You felt that way. My soul is in anguish. How long, God? How long am I gonna keep feeling like this? Keeps going. Another Psalm, Psalm 10.1. Why, Lord, do you stand far off? You ever felt that way where it's like, I heard you were near. I heard it was God with us. But man, you feel like forever away. Why do you hide yourself in the times of trouble? Like God, if I've ever needed you, it's now. Where are you? Continuing on, Psalm 38, 9 through 11. All my longings lie open before you, Lord. I'm just bearing my soul. My sighing is not even hidden from you. My heart pounds, my strength fails me. Even the light is gone from my eyes. My friends and companions avoid me because of my wounds. My neighbors stay far away. It's like everyone who comes near me, they're like, don't go near him. Stay away from her. It's bad luck, bad things. They, it is not good. They're in a bad place. And I'm all laid out before you, Lord. Just a few more. Psalm 42, 7. Deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls and all your waves and breakers have swept over me. Like, Lord, I feel like I'm just consumed by what is going on. And then one more, one more in Psalm 131. Out of the depths, I just cry to you, Lord. 
And I don't, I don't know your story. I don't know what you're dealing with. I don't know what you're processing. But what I wanna say to you is, what if in those terrible, terrible moments or seasons, come on, look at me. What if instead of those crushing us, they could catalyze us? What if instead of those defeating us, they could develop us? What if in those moments when we need to lament and we need to deal with it, what if instead of being pushed away from God, we were drawn near to God? What if I told you that that season, that thing, that anguish, that cry could actually be the thing that God is gonna use to move your faith forward the most. I think what we see in the Lament Psalms is this incredible idea of we could win these moments that while they're dark, they're not created equal because they can be used really well. Let me say it to you this way. I think stewarded well, awful moments can produce awesome growth. Awesome moments, awful moments can produce awesome growth. What if I told you that properly processing the lament Psalms could get you from, instead of cursing God, to blessing God? Now, please hear this. I am not at any moment gonna try to minimize the awfulness of what you might be feeling. I'm not at any moment gonna disregard or try to delegitimize or tell you it's not that bad, it's not my heart, because it may be that bad. It may be that real, it may be that difficult, it may be that toxic, it may be that debilitating, it may be all of those things. But I really believe that if we steward these moments and seasons well, awful moments could produce awesome growth. And, and the lament Psalms give us like a superpower secret key to this. And when I say it, you're gonna go, that's boring. I don't know that that's really awesome. I wish you would give me something more cool than that. I wish you would give me something that sounds more romantic and more enticing than that. But listen to me, this is the superpower. This is the secret sauce to stewarding those seasons in your life where you need to lament, those moments in your life. If you are going to move forward, here it is, ready? It's this, it's that good theology is the secret sauce. That good theology is the secret sauce. And some of you just checked out. I like this talk until that note, Keith, I was good. So, so like good theology, like a class, like a book. No, no, no. Good theology means a good understanding of who God is. You know what helps you turn the awful into awesome? When you know who God is, when you know who you are, when you know his character, when you know his mission, when you know his essence, when you know his faithfulness, when you know his goodness, and you stand smack dab in the middle of the waves, and you say, you know what, amidst all of it, I know God. I know God. And good theology keeps you, listen to me, from believing lies about yourself and lies about him. And oftentimes in the middle of this desperation and discouragement and despair and difficulty, what you need to do is you need to anchor and go back and say, what did I know to be true before I got here? My wife has said to me for the 26 years that we have been together in dating and then in marriage, she has said to me so many times, Keith, do not let become uh, false in the darkness what you knew to be true in the light. Over and over, she said that to me. And we have to have good theology where we anchor down to truth. And what the Lament Psalms do is they, they walk us through this process of going, I'm gonna know what is true about God and I'm gonna know what is true about me. And that is going to help me get through this. The reason some of us don't learn to take the awful and turn it into awesome is because we don't actually know, remember, connect and identify who God really is. Now, what the lament psalms do is they walk us through the process of what is going on in people's head and their heart and their soul as they're dealing with these things. And for a second, I, I want to just coach us out of what some of us might think we should do when we're lamenting. 
In fact, I wanna, I wanna for just a moment, talk about the, the negative or not so good approaches that some of you might confuse as processing or lamenting. For some of us, when really difficult stuff happens, we have been trained to do this. We've just been trained to deny it. We've just been trained to deny it. For some of you, you don't know how to do the lament psalm because you've been told you're not to lament. You've just been told, rub some dirt on it and get back in there, buck up, buttercup, it'll go away. Be tough, don't cry. There are some of us that are not willing to admit that life has knocked us on our butt. There's some of us that are not willing to say the, titu- the situation is terrible. There's some of us that deny it and pretend it's not real. And then we escape and we do a bunch of things that we shouldn't do. And some of you say, okay, I want to, I think I want to learn to lament, but what you've been trained to do and what you have to break doing is you've got to stop denying that something bad is in your life. Something terrible, something awful. Now there's another category that's a bad approach that for some of you, you don't deny, you just dwell on it. In fact, it's, it's all you think about. It's all you talk about. It's all you pray about. It becomes all consuming. And again, I'm not saying it's not bad, but you just stay there and listen to me. Listen, this is huge. For many of us, when we dwell on it, it suddenly becomes the thing that defines us. And lamenting is not permission to live there forever. Lamenting is not permission to dwell in it forever, to stay there. It's not permission to become defined by it. It's not permission to just keep pontificating and complaining and marinating and letting it become your identity. And for some of us, you think you're lamenting it, you think you're processing it, but really all you're doing is you're dwelling in it till it defines you. And then for others of us, we, we go to the third one, which is we demand. And this is what this means. God, this is hard. And I told you, so fix it <laughs> now. God, I was honest. I processed it. I didn't deny it. I didn't dwell in it. I told you it. So do something now. And some of us, when we're in that season, when we're in that moment, when we're in that difficulty, what we do is we demand of God. And what we say is, I'm just lamenting it. I'm lamenting it. Listen to me. I love you. You're trying to play God. You're trying to play God. You're demanding of God that it should be this way for whatever reason. So what I wanna do is I wanna teach us to leverage lament. I wanna teach us to work through how we really process these difficult moments and look at David and a story from scripture and one of the Psalms that we get from him and and process. How do we leverage lament to take the awful and make it awesome? How do we work through this so we can be better on the other side? You got a Bible, turn on or turn to Psalm 57. Psalm 57. We're going to look at this lament psalm and learn from it and hopefully allow it to really shape our souls. Uh, Psalm 57, this is one of those where we actually get a unique example of like a title to it. It gives us a little bit of information about what we should expect in this psalm. Uh, And so we see that in Psalm 57, it says this, for the director of music, and it actually tells us when they sang this song, what tune it was to. It was to the tune, Do Not Destroy, which apparently was a very popular song. And in fact, multiple psalms here in a row were written to be sung to this song, Do Not Destroy. And then it says it's a a mictum, which is really just a musical term to describe what it is. And then it says, this psalm was when David had fleed from Saul into a cave. Now that's really important because you need to be reminded of what the situation is as we look at this psalm. David who wrote this is fleeing from King Saul. David had been anointed king. That's great news to him, not to King Saul. And King Saul had said, I don't want you to be king. And he came after him and he had run him out of the, really the kingdom. And he had moved him out and he had gotten thousands of people, put a bounty on David's head and had chased David down and was trying to kill him. David had gotten a group of soldiers together to try and defend himself, but he's really in a difficult place. And he's in a cave and there's scholastic debate on which cave he's in. Some say he's in a cave often in Gedi, which he spent some time there. Others say he's in a cave in the cave called Adullam. But nevertheless, David is hiding out, trying to protect himself from these people who are coming after him to kill him. 
And here's how the Psalm begins in Psalm 57, verse one. Have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. And some of you, that's what you felt. God, have mercy on me. God, stop this. I don't wanna be here anymore. Can we, can we turn the page? Can we ask, God, I'm asking for your mercy. God, I'm waving the white flag. I'm calling uncle, have mercy on me. David's like, I don't really wanna die. Is there any way, have mercy on me? And he says, have mercy on me, my God. Again, have mercy on me. But then he says something so important. For in you, I take refuge. Now this is really important because the play on words is really mindful of the scenario that David is in. David's refuge physically is a cave, but his refuge in his heart is his God. You hear what I'm saying? His, his refuge physically is a cave, but where he really is, is he's dwelling and hiding and seeking the Lord. For some of us, we make the wrong thing our refuge in crisis. And he says, have mercy on me where I'm gonna hide, where I'm gonna go is to you. He continues to move through this and he says this, I will take refuge in the shadow of your wings until the disaster has passed. Notice at this point, he, he doesn't say, hey, God, I'm innocent. Saul's being a jerk. How could you let this happen to me? Are you kidding me? God, like, like be done with this in a way where you tell everybody I didn't do anything wrong. He just says, listen, we know what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna wait this out. And the way I'm gonna wait it out is I'm just gonna dwell and hide and connect to you. Come on, some of us in despair, some of us in discouragement, what we do is the cave we run to is a bottle or a drug or our kids or our job or our stuff. He goes, no, no, no. The, the cave that I'm gonna run to is you. I'm gonna hide under your wings. And I believe he's confident. He's like, until the disaster has passed, I know it will. Until then, I'm sticking with you, God. And then he keeps going as he moves to the story. I cry out to God most high, to God who vindicates me. This is not a hope. This is a, a statement of fact that he believes vindicates here is an interesting word. It's the idea that God in this, you have given me purpose. You have held me together. You have directed me that God amidst all of this craziness, amidst these people seeking me, amidst me hiding out in a cave with this group of people, you got me, you're leading me. You have given me unique purpose in this. David continues as he laments. He sends from heaven. He's just so confident in the character of God. He sends from heaven and saves me, rebuking those who hotly pursue me. He's like, I know these people are after me, but I trust you, God, to do what you're going to do. Ready? And it may be in your Bible. It may not. But then here's our word. Ready? The word that shows up in the next word is Selah. They sing this, they write this, they talk about this, they meditate on this. And David's like, I'm in this predicament. It is awful. It is crazy. But God, I'm gonna hide in you. God, I'm gonna trust you. God, I know you have purpose for me. God, I know you're gonna take care of it. And then he pauses. And he reflects. And he considers. And then he goes back to writing the song. And he says this in the next part of the verse. After he pauses and ponders, he then lets this out. God sends forth his love and his faithfulness. I, I don't know your situation. And again, I'm, it's real, it's bad. I, I, I don't know that you're in a cave being pursued to be killed. And in the middle of that, did you notice it? After David pauses and ponders, what does he connect to? He connects to the character of God. And he says, God, even in this, you send forth your love and your faithfulness. He goes to this word as a really important word in the Old Testament. It's the Hebrew word has said. It's this covenant love that God has poured out on his people to say, you are my people and I'm not going anywhere. And he says, you have given me love. You have given me promises. I'm just gonna hold into that. And then he keeps going and he comes back to the situation and he says, I'm in the midst of lions. This is how he describes the people. I'm forced to dwell among Ravenous beasts, men whose teeth are spears and arrows, whose tongues are sharp swords. 
I, I want you to notice he's not denying the difficulty of the situation. He feels the wrath of these people pursue him. He knows they want to kill him. He knows that it's bad and he's saying it, he's addressing it. And then he continues to process it. And he says this, this is crazy. But amidst all this, God, amidst these lions, amidst these people, the spears, oh, be exalted, oh God. <laughs> Above the heavens, let your glory be all over the earth. Wow. Do you, do you guys see that in the middle, look at me, in the middle of his chaos, he took his eyes off of himself and he put them on the Lord. And he took the focus, listen to me, he took the focus off of his pain and he put it on praise to his God. He took the focus on what's going on him and he said, God, amidst all of it, I want people to see you. Wow, wow. David continues and he says this. They spread a net for my feet. They were coming to get me. I was bowed down in distress. It was awful. It was not good. They dug a pit in my path. And then he's like, but God, they've fallen into it themselves. It's terrible and it's bad, but you are still taking care of me. You are still providing for me. You are still making it go forward. And then says this, ready? Say la. Stop. Pause, ponder. And he does that and he reflects. And then I just love the way the Psalm ends as he goes forward, ready? He comes back to it. My heart, oh God, this is so cool. Again, he reflects. This is a terrible situation, but God, you're in it. My heart, oh God, is steadfast. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and make music. Awake my soul, awake harp and lyre. I will awaken at the dawn. In other words, he says, even amidst people wanting to kill me in a cave, I will set the alarm at 5 a.m. and I will get up and I will worship you. I will worship you. I know they want to kill me. I know it's dark. I know it's difficult, but you are still God. And so I will get up early in the morning and I will say, God, be exalted. Wow. 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 He continues and he moves forward in the psalm and he says, I will praise you, Lord. Among the nations, I will sing of you among the peoples. For great is your love reaching to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. And see, some of you, you are like, yeah, but he's a Bible character. Of course he gets it right. <laughs> I mean, it's a Bible guy. It's David. Yeah, it's David. You remember the same guy who committed adultery with a woman and then had that woman's husband killed, that same guy who manipulated, that same guy is the same guy who in this moment, these things are happening. And then he finishes up and he, he just says it again. Be exalted second time, oh God. Above the heavens, let your glory be over all the earth. You know, sometimes when... Uh, we look at scripture and we say this stuff, it, it sounds like platitudes. Maybe it feels cliched, maybe it feels simplistic. But just because something might be a simple soundbite or it might feel cliche doesn't mean it's not true. And what David is teaching us, in fact, what all the lament Psalms teach us is that when the world punches and you feel stuck, and you're up against it and it's just dark and it's difficult and it's awful. If you wanna make it awesome, if you want to move in the direction God wants you to move, if you want to move forward, here's what you have to do. You move forward through focusing upward. You move forward through focusing upward. You get better, you heal you navigate, you persevere. I know it's hard and I know it's bad, but there is freedom. There is a path forward, but it's focusing on what is upward. And here's what some of us do when it's dark. And I get it. We focus inward. Or we look around and we blame those horizontally. Or even worse, we, 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 we turn our eyes down and we, we get darker into despair. And yet David says, they want to kill me. They're coming after me. They're setting a pit up for me. They've got traps. They've got nets. They've got spears. But what I'm going to do to move forward is I'm going to focus upward. 
If I'm gonna turn awful into awesome, if I'm gonna leverage this moment and not all moments are equal, if I'm really gonna get this done, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna focus on the person of God, his said love, his covenant faithfulness. This is why the scripture says, as you go through life, come on, fix your eyes on the author and perfecter of your faith. Because when, when it's hard, when, when sorrow comes and you lose the person, when you don't get the job, when the diagnosis is terrible, when the, when the kids blow up their life, when it all happens, you stop and you look and you go, there is a God who loves me so much that even in my rebellion, he came and he chased me and he died for me and he rose again and he's gonna return and he's building his kingdom and he's still alive and he's still on his throne and you grab that. And then you buck up and you take another step. But if you want to move forward, you can't look down, you can't look in, you can't look at everybody else, you look upward. And David said in the middle of all of it, I take refuge in you, God. I see you, God. I go after you, God. Man, what would happen if we did that? What would happen if we considered Christ in the middle of all of it? We considered his faithfulness. We considered what he's done. We trusted in what he's gonna do. And when, when we do this, when we lament this way, when we move forward by looking upward, I wanna give you a way to think about this. Like the, the lament Psalms kind of all work through this process. And I'll just, I'll give this to you in this way and then we'll just unpack this more, all right? But this is what happens in the lament Psalms. They want you to be human, be humble, and then be hopeful, that's what the, the lament psalms allow you to do. Is to be human, to be humble, and then to be hopeful. Be human. Cry. Grieve. Get angry. Feel desperate. Feel in pain. Feel disappointment. Feel discouraged. Feel it. Be human. I am not asking you to deny your humanness. What I am asking you to do, what the Psalms are asking you to do, what God is asking you to listen to me is to not stop at just being a human, but to live like a Christian. <laughs> and that means what you do is in the middle of that humanness, you go, okay, God, God, I'm humble. You're God, I'm not. I don't know what you're doing. I don't know that I get it. I don't know that I understand it. But I, I submit to you. I want to follow you. I, I'm still in God. And then not only do you stay humble, but you go hopeful, you go God, you're good and you're gonna work for your glory and you're kind of always doing cool stuff. And so I trust you. So I'm not just gonna be human and I'm not just gonna be humble, but I'm actually gonna come through a place where this awful can be awesome because I believe you're still good. So I'm gonna keep moving, God. I'm gonna move forward by focusing upward. I'm gonna, I'm gonna lock in. Now, what you've gotta see is, is the theology that David had, that good theology, how did it work? And I know that as I go through a few of these, some of you that are like in it right now, you're gonna bristle a little bit because what, you're, what you want to say is, Keith, you're, you're just not letting me feel. No, I'm letting you feel, but what I want you to do is I want you to more than feel, I want you to heal. I want you to move forward. And so the, the, the first thing that I'm gonna say, it... it, it about focusing upward, it's, it's potentially gonna feel insensitive, but it's not, and it's the secret to good theology. It's where everything changes. And here's what David knew about people coming to kill him in a cave. And here's what you and I, if we're followers of Jesus, need to know if you're not a follower of Jesus, this is what Christians should believe and should live out. And in the middle of this, we need to remember that it's not about us. It's not about us. David knew multiple times that it was not about him. How do I know that? Because he said, I will praise you. And twice he said, be exalted, be exalted. In other words, what he said was, God, in the middle of all this, what I care about more. He, he wasn't saying he didn't care about being protected. He did. He wasn't caring, saying that he didn't care about things happening with Saul or being safe or his men being safe. He cared about all that. But you know what superseded all of that? Listen, God's glory. You know what superseded everything? God's glory. Here's what he said. Whether I get out of the cave or not, your glory needs to happen through this situation and I'm willing to be your instrument. No matter what goes on, 
I know this isn't about me, it's about you. No matter what I feel, no matter what I deal with, what I want people to do is to see you. You know, you know what God's glory is? God's glory in the way that it shows up through us is this. Glory is the visible manifestation of the power and presence of the invisible God. Glory is the visible manifestation of the power and presence of the invisible God that shows up through Christians. You know what a lot of us need in our heart? Is we need what's called the Copernicus Revolution. Up until the 16th century, people believed that the center of basically the universe was the earth. And they treated it as it, it was such. In other words, they believed that everything that existed revolved around us. And so Copernicus came along and he rebuked and he corrected and through different methods, he said, no, that's not true. He said, actually, the earth is not the center of anything. In fact, what's at the center of our solar system is the sun. And suddenly the switch of what was in the middle changed everything, some of us. We need a revolution where we realize what's at the center of all things is not us, but the sun. That Jesus Christ is at the center. And I know it's awful. And I know it's terrible. And I know it's dark. But do you want to know how you move forward? You focus upward. So in the middle of all the hell that you're experiencing, you look, you say, God, you take this hell and you make it holy for your glory. You take this stuff and you turn all of it into something that when people look, somehow they see you. Man, that changes your purpose. That changes your purpose. You walk into things very differently. You know, you can be doing the same exact thing, but if your purpose changes, you go after it very differently. I mean, what, what if you uh, told your kids to cut the yard and you said, hey, you cut the grass or you're grounded? Their purpose for cutting the grass would be, I don't want to be grounded. But what if you told them, if you cut the grass, I just want to let you know that somewhere along the way, amidst the grass that you're about to cut, I hid $500 in an envelope for you. <laughs> same lawnmower, same grass, same lawn, different attitude. Because the purpose of the lawn mowing changed. Listen to me, um, listen to me. Your cancer isn't about you. It's about God's glory. Your difficult work situation is not about you. It's about God's glory. Your trial with those people in your life is not about you. It's about God's glory. Your ongoing battle with that chronic illness. I know it's awful, but it's not about you. It's about God's glory. The financial situation that's messed things up. It's not about you. It's about God's glory. What did David say? I'm in a cave. They want to kill me. It's not about me. Be exalted, O oh God. How do you move forward? You focus upward. It's not about me. It's not about what goes on. Everything in life changes when you realize life is not about you, but it's about him. And here's the problem. Our default setting is selfish. My default setting is about me. What I think about is about me. And yet the God I serve didn't think about himself, but instead emptied himself of his power and came to earth and became a servant to die on my behalf. And as a result, he deserves glory for not just being my creator, but for being my savior. How do we move forward? We focus upward and we say, it's not about us. This thing is not about me. It doesn't mean it's not awful. It doesn't mean it's not terrible, but be exalted, oh God. Number two, David understood that. Number two, David said, I need to examine what God is doing in me. I need to examine what God is doing in me. David said, God is my refuge. He vindicates me. He gives me purpose. He holds me together. He says, I trust you, God. I know that you are my real cave and I hide in you. I know that you are faithful and I know that you love me. This is a really significant switch, but what if, uh, what if the terrible, awful thing was actually somehow God doing something in you that was for your good? 
I got reached out to by someone at the church. This was a number of years ago. And they said, um, Pastor Keith, would you, would you meet with me? I want to talk to you about something. And uh, I said, and I've learned to say this, I learned, I sent him a text back and I said, hey, I'd love to meet with you, but I, I'd love to know what the meeting is about. I, I learned a long time ago that sometimes when you go to meetings and you don't know what it's about, you get blindsided by stuff and it's not real helpful. And actually it can be quite hurtful. And the person said to me, I'd rather not tell you, would you just come to the meeting? And I thought, oh great, they're gonna complain about the church and my preaching and they're gonna tell me how everything's terrible and I'm gonna wanna slash their tires when we leave and it's not gonna be fun, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> and, uh, and here's the truth, here's the truth. This happened before I changed a policy, so I'll just tell you this. If you ever wanna meet with me and you won't tell me why, I won't meet with you. I just won't. Because I've just learned that it's not fun. I don't wanna be submarine. I don't wanna be attacked. It's not fair to anybody. So I just, I did, but this one, I took and I didn't know what it was about. And I drove to the place where we were meeting and I thought it was just gonna be terrible. And super dis I was like super discouraged before I got there and blah, blah, blah. So I sit down and we order the food and uh, I start to talk to the person. It's much small talk for the first few minutes, you know, being polite, all that kind of stuff. And then I said, kind of begrudgingly, so what did you wanna meet with me about? And then I just kind of braced myself. And he reached to the chair that was right next to him and he said, I just wanna tell you, I think you're an incredible pastor and I love you. Oh, <laughs> and he handed me a gift. He had gotten me something that he knew I'd like. He handed me something and he said, hey, I just, I just wanted to encourage you today. And see, what had happened was in my soul, I had positioned that he was gonna take something from me and he actually had something for me. What if in your soul, the awful despair thing that you think God is actually doing that is taking something from you is actually something God is giving to you? What if in the middle of all of that, that moving forward means focusing upward means that what God's really trying to develop in you is first of all, he's trying to break you from all the refuges that you go to that are dumb. And that the refuge that you need to go to is him. And he's trying to take all those other ones away. And he's trying to say, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. It's terrible. You keep running to your talent. Stop. Run to me. You keep running to your money. Stop. Run to me. You keep running to your career. Stop. Run to me. He's trying to break us of that. And by the way, that's a gift of God. Maybe he's trying to make you more steadfast. Maybe he's trying to make you more patient. Maybe he's trying to make you more forgiving, more loving, more gracious, more understanding. Maybe he's cultivating trust and dependence. I don't know what it is, but maybe he's just trying to break something in you because maybe this is what he's trying to do. Maybe he's not trying to change the circumstance. He's trying to change the person in the circumstance. David said, God, it's terrible, but you're my refuge and you vindicate me and you move in me. So the way I'm gonna move forward is I'm gonna focus upward. And when that happens, I'll see what you're doing in me. I'll trust in you. Would you be willing to consider that whatever you're facing, maybe God is doing something incredible for you? Like we either believe this or we don't because the Bible says this in a, in a passage that we like to, to put on a, a blanket and put in our living room, but it's scripture and it says, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. And not just that love him, but have been called according to his purpose in their life. And then it says, you know what he does to those people for good? He conforms them to the image of his son. Would you be willing to consider that as difficult as it is, it's not about you. It's actually about God's glory being conformed in you so that you move forward by focusing upward. And in the end, people will see God. Number three, every lament gets to this and it's so powerful. Every lament means we've got to move to the pivot. We've got to move to the pivot. And each lament that you read in Psalms, there's this beautiful reality where the psalmist is real and is raw and is human and is humble, but then they always become hopeful. They don't stay in their despair, they move. They, they pivot and in their radical trust of God's sovereignty, in their belief of God's sovereignty, they say, but God, and they're okay. Now I... I can't say the word pivot without being taken back to a, a TV show in a moment in a show. And some of you who are laughing across the church right now know exactly the moment and exactly the show. The number one show when I was a young adult was the show Friends. We watch it as a group of people actually after Bible study on Thursday night, ironically, because it was so terrible in terms of what it represented. But we would watch it and there's this famous scene that you can find where Ross is trying to move a couch. 
And he's trying to move a couch and, and Chandler and, and, and Rachel are there and they're trying to get this couch up the stairs and they've got to go up and then they've got to turn and there's railings and they're trying to pick it up. And, and Ross over and over, he's yelling, pivot, <laughs> pivot, pivot. And he just keeps saying it until Chandler says, shut up, shut up, shut up. <laughs> it's a hilarious scene. And every time I hear the word pivot, I, I think of that scene. I think of Ross saying that. And as I was reading this Psalm, what I could see was there was this one moment where it became so clear that David pivoted. And over and over the psalmists, they pivot. And what they do is they go from not just being human and not just humble, but hopeful. And they pivot and they say, God, I'm not going to stay here. I trust that someday you're going to free me. And what I want for us to believe is that our God can give us hope in the middle of the crisis. And the psalmists always pivot to it. The psalmists look and they say, you're gonna get my enemies. You're gonna move forward. You're gonna leverage this pain for your glory. You're not gonna stay stuck. How do you know you're stuck? You're stuck when you become cynical and critical about everything through the lens of the situation. You're stuck when you can't forgive. You're stuck when you just play the same conversation in your head over and over and over and over. You're stuck when you have no hope. You're stuck when you say, my awfulness will always be awfulness. And David says, nope. My good theology gets me to a place where it says, God, I don't know how, I don't know when, but I know you will, and I trust you. How do we win in the middle of the awful to make it awesome? How do we win at those incredibly unique moments of pain? We trust in God. We have great theology and we move forward by focusing upward. And again, I don't know your situation. I don't know what you're dealing with, but here's what I wanna tell you is so important. Listen to me, in your despair, here's what I beg of you. In your despair, move towards God, not away. One of the things that grieves me as a pastor is that I've just watched too many people in the middle of the, the bad, the awful, run from God, run from church, run from his word, rather than moving towards him. Rather than leaning and rather than saying, I'm gonna focus upward on God. Whatever you're dealing with, wherever you're at, I just want you to move towards him. Oftentimes in school, when they would teach you something, sometimes even at work, if they were gonna teach you something and then want you to do it before they, before they left or before you went home, they would say, we're gonna do a, we're gonna do a sample problem. We're gonna work through this so we can make sure that we understand it in our soul. We wanna make sure that we slow down and understand the work. And so I wanna do that. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to grab your program. And even if you're not a follower of Jesus, wherever you're at, you can, you can still do this. You, don't, you might not come to the same conclusions, but I want you to process it. And here's what I want you to do on your program. I'm asking you to do it. Come on. Grab your program. And what I want you to write on your program is a, a current moment or a past moment, a current season or a past season of awfulness. Like write it down. In words, I, I know that this was terrible. This season was dark. This was discouraging and desperate and difficult. And I want you to write it on the paper. And then as a follower of Jesus, whatever you have written, I want you to look at it and I want you to just think this in your head. Whatever you wrote in your head, say this. This is not about me and I want you to have glory for it, God. It's not about me. It's happening to me, but it's not about me. I want you to get glory through this. I even want you to get glory if it was in the past and how I handle it and how I talk about how, God, this isn't about me. I'm gonna move forward by focusing upward. I want you to keep looking at that phrase or that sentence or whatever it is. And then I want you to say in your head, God, I know you're making me like your son through this and I'm gonna look for how you're doing it. God, I know you're making me like your son through this and I'm gonna look for how you're doing it. And then lastly, I want you to look at it and I want you to say in your head, God, you want me to be human, but you don't want me to stay human. You want me to be a Christian. So although it hurts and I am discouraged, 
I will not stay in this place because I trust you. I know I'm human. I know it feels awful, but I'm a Christian. And although it hurts and I'm discouraged, I will not stay there. I do not pretend to know how God is always working in your life or mine, but I can confidently say he is. And I can confidently say that for those of us who love him, he is always moving and doing things for our good, even when it feels bad. What if we could leverage this notion of even when we don't see it, even when we don't know it, even when we don't feel it, we will move forward because we will focus upward. Let me pray for us. God, I pray for those who are just in it right now. Those who discouragement and despair and desperation and difficulty mark their days. And I pray that you help them to be human, to be humble, but by your power, you would help them to be hopeful and you would allow them to move forward by focusing upward. God, you are not distant and you are not asleep. You are moving even when we don't see it. Help us to learn to take the awful to awesome by trusting in you. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.